I had a cocaine problem. Um, <laughs> I was totally naive. Bob was a blessing to me. We were in a building project, <clears throat> and uh, <laughs> man, was he a blessing. He, he had some carpenter skills. Matter of fact, he could do just about anything. His real trade was he was a, a, a concrete carpenter, a frame, form frame guy. So he wasn't real detailed as far as trim and all, but he could do enough to get by. And Bob would just do anything, and he would work so hard, and, and he would just, and, and the guy would, had a brilliant mind. He was just like, his mind was on fire all the time with knowledge and wisdom. And, and he could, I'm not exaggerating, he could quote probably 75% of the New Testament. I remember when he had only been there about three or four times to church. And in Sunday school class, the teacher said, uh, Bob, could you, uh, could you read, I don't remember what, it was one chapter of Ephesians. Read cha and he just starts, and we all thought he was reading it. And somebody turned around and said, he's quoting that. And everybody turned around and he was quoting that. He was just sitting there just quoting it. He didn't even have a Bible with him. And, uh, you know, everybody was so impressed with him. Anyway, time rocked along. And we were in the final stages of getting our church ready. And we were kind of under pressure. And I, two or three days in a row, I'd, I would leave, be the last one to leave except for Bob. And... He was just running that table saw, rawr, 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 sawing and nailing, sawing and nailing. I mean, he worked fast as you can believe and working hard. And he, and he was sleeping at the church because he didn't have anywhere to live. Well, his mom lived in another town, but it was too far to get back so early in the morning. So he was asleep at the church. <clears throat> That's what I thought. And the next morning, I get there at 7 o'clock, and Bob's still running that table saw. Rawr, rawr, and man, he got all this work done. This went for two or three days. And, Finally, I, I, you know, I said, Bob, I said, uh, man, did you, did you, don't you ever sleep? No, 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 I've been working all night. He'd been working for two or three days, day and night. <coughs> I'm naive. I'm thinking, man, this guy is committed to God. <laughs> I didn't have any idea. He was strung out on coke. And I mean, this guy was doing the work of two or three men and having a ball. He was just, man, he was just going at it. And uh, I remember we, we had an enormous uh, room that we were turning into a sanctuary. He'd get the end of a big old roll of old nasty carpet that we had pulled out. He'd get one end, it'd take three guys to get the other end, you know. Just, you know. What is it with this guy? I was so naive, I didn't realize that Bob had a, had a real issue that he needed help with. Bob loved God. I'm talking, he loved God tremendously. And he was at church because he loved the Lord and he wanted help. He didn't tell any of us he had a problem. Eventually, it dawned on me, something's not normal because this ain't no Superman. And I finally asked him, I said, Bob, what's going on? He said, well, I kind of have a drug problem. And he told me about his problem. And I went to his house all the way over to the next town to meet his mom. And then I saw the other side of the situation. And she was very taken advantage of for years. And, you know, there's always that painful side. The person who's been supporting them, that's been helping them, making it possible for them to continue like they are. Bob's 40 years old and still half the time living at home and half the time living wherever he could find to live. And that was Bob. And one more story about Bob. Bob wanted to be in the choir. And at this particular time, I don't know why, but Laurie decided we needed choir rows. And we had built a choir loft similar to your baptism, except it was a big choir loft that was built up. And I don't know why in the world, because we were never religious like that, but they decided they wanted choir robes. They all had these choir robes on. <clears throat> and Bob was on the back row in the choir, in a pretty big choir. And he got all excited on a Sunday morning. And we had a pretty good-sized crowd. And, 
he got all excited. and he, Something about choir robes makes it worse. You know what I mean? It's a little stiff, you know? And he's, uh, he starts getting excited in the back row. Nobody in the, choir, in the row in front of him could see what's going on. The people beside him, they were all singing their nice song. He starts getting excited. Now, I guess it was the drugs. I don't know. And he starts just, you know, he's doing like this. And the next thing I know, he's taking his robe off. And when it gets up over his head, it gets hung on his shirt. And he's pulling his shirt, and his whole shirt comes off. And he's up here with this robe over his head. He can't get it off. His shirt's up, up to here. His old big old hairy belly. You hear what I'm saying? He's still dancing around like this. He's tied up in his thing. And, <laughs> and I looked around the crowd, and the eyes were just like this. I'm not even sure he knew what he was doing. You know. You can't help but love a guy like that. But at the same time, we've got to help him, amen? And we did help Bob. We, we had an opportunity to help Bob. And for several years, he, he stayed with us in the church and everything. Uh, eventually, an old crime he had committed because of his drugs caught up with him and he went to jail. But he stayed with us for several years before that appeared which is something that oftentimes happens with people that have been involved in drugs. Things from their past will catch up even after they get, you know, get the help they need. And they have to go ahead and pay that price and then come back out and go on. But it's okay. Another example I had, same church at a different time, was a, a married man who was addicted to prescription drugs. and He had a terrible back problem. But he got to taking too many. And this went on for quite a while. And I got a call one night... <clears throat> from his daughter, and he's, she said, Daddy's got Mom in the bedroom, and he's got his thirty-eight pistol at her head. And uh, they said, please don't call the police. Precious family. Precious guy. Precious family. Beautiful children. Beautiful wife. I mean, he had everything in the world. His, he came from a very wealthy family. He had a lot of money. They had a lot of money. Nice home. Um... You know, you're like, God, I want to help these people. You had them call me. I ended up on the bed with them. And I look back down, I think, you know, I should have called the police. But, you know, you don't want, because you don't want him to go to jail. That's not what he needs. But at the same time, it could have been more than her got killed, amen? So you got to really use wisdom in these situations. You say, why are you telling us these stories? Because I want you to understand that we're dealing with life or death issues here, but these are ordinary people. These are fun-loving, good people from good families and good normal lives who have problems as children, who have physical problems that led to problems. People that love God. People with, with money. Not just people that, you know, were on skid row. Good people. I had a guy in a church, just the last church I pastored. We'll call him Scott. He came to church. He was about 37 or 38 probably. He was a single guy. Had been married earlier in life. But he'd had a drug problem. Uh, supposedly he had got it under control. He came in with us. He was doing great. About a year with us, he was helping around the church, and, uh, and he wanted to be a blessing, so he started cleaning the church and didn't want us to pay him. We had, you know, we'd always paid somebody to clean the church, and he cleaned the church for six months, and just he was so faithful, dependable. Every Sunday morning you get there, everything was beautiful. Great job. All of a sudden, out of the blue one Sunday morning, I showed up. The church was clean, but all the sound equipment and instruments were gone. You don't want to accuse anybody. You know what I'm saying? But at the same time, I had to ask, amen, because some of those instruments belong to people in the church. I mean, you know, guitar too, electric guitar too. I mean, we're talking several thousand dollars worth of stuff. Everything was gone. So I call Scott. And I said, you coming to church this morning? Oh, Pastor, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to make it this morning. He always came to church. 
He wasn't going to make it because he was high. I said, uh, how come? I'm not feeling too good. I said, Scott, you know anything about the sound equipment missing? He mumbled something. I couldn't understand it. And uh, I don't think I was supposed to. And I said, I said, Scott, I said, I don't want to accuse you of anything because I believe in you, man. I said, I'm for you 100%. But I said, everything makes me think that you know something about it. And I said, uh, I'm facing to call the police. And I'm not going to accuse you. But they're going to be searching to figure out what happened. And I said, and, and I, they're going to ask me, who was the last person here? And I said, and you always clean after 10 p.m. on Saturday night. And I said, so you might as well get ready. They come into your house. And I said, that'll be between you and them. I said, but I tell you what I will do. And I didn't think this would work, even, even if, because I figured he'd done pawned it, sold it or something, because I figured he's already high. You know, that's why he wasn't coming to church. But I said, I, I said I, this, was, this was about 8 o'clock maybe. I said, I'll give you until 9.30 because we need that equipment back here by 10.30. I said, if you are the guy, but I'm not accusing you. I said, I'll give you to 9.30 to bring the stuff back or at least come and tell me who did it, where it is, or something. And then I'm going to call the police. I said, so, you know, if you know anything and you want to get out of this, you got to 9.30. I said, if you didn't do anything, don't worry about it. Okay, Pastor. Hung up. About 9.35. I didn't call right away. About 9.35, he comes in the door. Backs with his truck backed up. He's unloading equipment, baby. <laughs> he still had every bit of it. You know, um, there's always that temptation and that's why they need a good follow-up program. They need some good contact, and they need good relationships. And they need people in the church that, you know, some type of a fellowship group or something that can periodically meet with them on the basis of, of their addiction. It's not that they're not free. It's that temptation is always at the door. Do you understand what I'm saying? You can be free, but the devil is going to always tell you that that opportunity is still there if you want it. You know, and I don't know what happened to him that night, what made him think. I mean, steal something anywhere, but not when everybody knows you's the last one there. You know what I'm saying? But, uh, you know, so, I mean, what I'm trying to tell you is these are typical scenarios of people who have addiction problems. They, they, basically, they'll do anything to anybody, even the people they love the most, to try to get that addiction satisfied. And, and even though it appears, you know, that they're just attacking you, it's really not personal. Um, they're, just trying to, they're just trying to survive in what their mind, that they think survival is. It's just a deception of the enemy is what it is. Uh, let's see. I wrote several down, but I'm not going to tell you all of them. I'll tell you about Starla is what I'm calling her. This was a good family in our church. They were in the church before we ever got there. And this was an upper middle class family. They had a little bit of money. Her parents went to our church and they were leaders in the church. This young lady was probably about 24 or 25 years old. Her husband was a little bit older than her. She, she basically had always had everything she ever wanted. Um, only child family of money, very sweet girl. They had one child herself. She was, one, she was a single child, only child, and, her, and they had, her and her husband had one child. Um, she was very attractive. Her husband was very attractive. I mean, it just seemed like the perfect picture family, you know. And, and she's very spiritual, uh, loved the Lord. And all of a sudden one day, um, never knew anything but was anything but perfect in their lives. And all of a sudden, one day, I get a phone call that she's in the psych ward and uh, has, she attempted suicide, but they found her. Her husband found her. 
So as the story plays out, she had become addicted to prescription drugs because, uh, well, she got addicted to prescription, here's how the story goes, she got addicted to prescription drugs because she was overwhelmed, anxious, because she had run up, run up the credit card so high and taken out and gotten more credit cards from anywhere she could get them and kept getting them and getting them and getting them until she couldn't get no more. But her husband didn't know about any of this. He didn't know that they owed all this money and that she had taken all these credit cards with all these big balances. And so she had all this big debt in their names. And I'm not sure what she was buying I, other than prescription drugs. <laughs> anyway, she was taking prescription drugs because she was scared that he was going to find out and didn't know what to do about all these bills. And now it had gotten to the point where she was behind on all their bills. And her husband didn't know, and she just freaked out and panicked, and she committed suicide. Well, you know, he fortunately found her, and she went to the hospital, and uh, she came home. She came to me for counseling for a while, and did real good for about a year and went through basically the same scenario again. Um, not the, the debt and all that because she wasn't able to do that, but uh, tried to commit suicide again. And, then, and I tried to uh, minister to her again. But pretty much she just was in a real heavy depression from then on and uh, still you know, heavily taking drugs and things of that nature. And she, but you know what? I don't know with her if it started with an addiction to spending or just wanting everything she wanted because she was used to having it all of her life. Um, I don't really know. But addiction leads people down a path of destruction. And that's why God needs people to rise up in people's lives and be willing to intervene and help them. The Apostle Paul said in the third chapter of Philippians, verse 10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his suffering. And we, we often really, you know, we really grab a hold and shout, the power of his resurrection. Yes, yes. But not many of us want to volunteer for the fellowship of his suffering. But, you know, that's the ministry that walks with people like this. Because I'm going to be honest with you, it's not fun helping someone in an addiction. It's not very easy. Um, because a lot of them, when they first come in, they don't really want your help, and they'll tell you. Um, she didn't really want my help. She loved me. She liked me because I've been her pastor for some time. And she was glad I was there, but she really wasn't interested in what I had to say or what I had to offer her for probably six months. And then she started, you know, opening up and seemed to improve, but it didn't last. And, uh, and she was back again in the hospital trying to commit suicide again. Um, and, you know, you look at people like this, you just think, you, you, you know, you're, you, you have everything. I want to tell you what, that's the whole point, is sometimes these people that are addicted realize that having everything or not having anything is the same thing. It means nothing. And that's why they get addicted. is because a lot of people who still think, if I can just have this and this, maybe I'll be happy. Those people, they're addicts too. They just hadn't got to the point yet where they've started taking something or smoking something or drinking something. They're just on their way. I don't know if you all understood what I just said. Okay, I won't tell you any more stories right now. But I, I wanted to just share a few of those with you. I know those weren't particularly happy stories. I will say this. Uh, Starla, I make sure I don't call the right name. Uh, she eventually, after the second time, she eventually grew out of it. And, and to this day, and it's been a long, long, long time, she's doing great. You know, her family's great, and she's gone on, and she's living a healthy life now. Actually, every one of these people have. Um, and there's some more I didn't tell you about, but... Even Bob. Bob's doing good now. But uh, they had to have help. 
They needed help and they needed ministry. Let's go to our study guide now. Everybody got one? Did you get a study guide? You didn't get it? Were you not able to mail that to her? You did mail it to her? Did you check your email? Oh. Michael, can you get her the password? Okay. It's like a bunch of dogs at the dinner bowl. You got to yelp if you want something. <laughs> okay, we're going to talk about addictions. All right, y'all ready? Okay. Uh, here's an introduction to addictions. Addictions of all types, I think we've already established, are serious. Alcoholism is the most widespread addiction in our society. It amazes me personally how common um, alcoholism now is now. Or, or let me say social drinking to start with. It blows my mind how uh, it just, it's, it's nothing now. Maybe it's because I live in the Metroplex. I don't know. Uh, but in the Metroplex, it's just like everybody drinks. And, and, and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with drinking. If you want to be technically scriptural, the Bible says it's wrong to be drunk. But the f- problem is, is that social drinking so often leads to drunkenness, which is what harms people. And that's, that's the concern. That's the issue. Uh, unfortunately, it's usually the people who think they can handle something that have a problem. <laughs> and you can't convince that person that they're going to have one because they think they can handle it, you know. And so it leads to a problem. Seventy percent of society drinks now. Uh, this first portion of material, I liked these resources and I drew from the U.K., because I just felt like it was more thorough and more complete than some of what I was finding statistic-wise and information in the United States. It's the same information. It's just better, okay? So I'm just letting you know that. But the percentages will be about the same everywhere. Uh, The largest percent that's ever been uh, recorded. More people drink now than have, as far as we know, since we've been recording it. Uh, People today are consuming an average of 30 gallons of alcohol a year. That's a whole lot of subs. Think about it. My goodness. 10% are heavy drinkers and 7% are problem drinkers or alcoholics. It's the third leading cause of death in America and is responsible for 50% of highway deaths. Can you imagine that? Half of the people who die on the highways of America, this is an American statistic, it was caused by someone who had consumed alcohol. Every year in the Metroplex, they have all these signs everywhere telling you all this good news on the highway, you know. And uh, every year they post throughout the year how many people died in Texas on the highways. And towards the end of the year, it's like 3,000, you know. And, and every year it just it startles me. I'm like, that many people died in Texas on the highways? Man. You know? It's like my wife used to, my wife, she, bless her heart, she's awesome. But she, huh. I make her drive most 90% of the time because I can't drive. She, she, she drives me crazy. You know, yeah, do, watch out for that. Don't do this. Do this. You know what I'm saying. Uh, I know y'all don't do that, ladies. But my wife does that. I tell her all the time, I said, just close your eyes till we get there. But that don't seem to satisfy her. So, but she, she'll, she'll, she'll tell me statistics. She'll say, you need to slow down. You need to slow down. You need to slow down. 75% of accidents happen within five miles of your home. And I'll tell her, i say, well, let's move then. You know, and stuff like that. And she's like, no, no, you know. But, <laughs> but she's always, always just, you know. But really, I just let her do the driving now, unless I'm by myself. Because that way she's happy. And she feels safe. And that way I take a nap. We'll be all right. But, you know, I, fi- I figure with as much as she sees when I'm driving, there's no way she'll ever have an accident if she's seeing all that. But she's driving. Right? I'm bound to be safe. Amen. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, uh, in these verses, 
And I wanted to read that to you. I've got it right here. You've got it in your notes towards the bottom of the page. I'm going to read to you this to you. Uh, these verses need to be con- interpreted as a continuous action. Let me read it to you. It says, uh, 1 Corinthians 6, 9, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revelers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. Now the one we're focused on here obviously is drunkards. So scripture says there that these people won't inherit the kingdom of God. Let's go ahead and finish reading the scripture just for the sake of uh, doing it right. And such were some of you. Now, Paul's just simply pointing out that we all have issues, amen? Um, And we've all, thank God, we've all been delivered from sin. God has, you know what I'm saying? Paul's not pointing fingers. He's saying we've all been there and God has delivered us all. Thank the Lord. He says, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. And all things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Now what's he saying uh, here? He's saying it's okay for me as a Christian to do what basically the Scripture permits me to do. But just because I can doesn't mean it's always profitable or beneficial for me to do it. That's what he's saying. And so we're looking at this thing in the light of drinking, for example. Now the Bible clearly says it's a sin and you won't inherit the kingdom of God if you're a drunkard. This is one of the reasons we've got to help addicts, amen? Amen. It doesn't say that if you're a drinker. You understand the difference? Drinker, drunker. Okay? But what it does say further down in this passage is that it may not be beneficial for you to be a drinker even though it's okay for you to be a drinker. Just because it's lawful doesn't mean it's expedient. And you have to Look at this thing objectively and discern what God is saying to you. I can't stand up here and preach to you with a red face like I'm mad at you and tell you, glory to God, you're going to go to hell if you sip a beer. You know why? The Bible doesn't say that. But I can tell you that the Bible does say it may not be profitable to you You better pray and ask him. Now, I can give you some scenarios in why God might tell you that it's not profitable. Do you have children? Do you have other young Christians in your life that are watching you? Are you related to someone who has an alcohol problem? Hmm? Are you a teacher or a preacher? On the worship team? Do you hold an office in the local church? I'm just saying that some of these that I just mentioned, the Bible clearly states that you shouldn't be drinking if you're in any of these positions. On the other hand, you might have to just go to God and say, God, the Bible does say that I'm not permitted to cause someone to stumble. Hmm. I mean, statistics do bear out that drinking parents have drinking children. Dope-using parents have dope-using children. So you'd have to think these things through before the Lord, amen? Amen? Off quietness, Presbyterian, Methodist, Baptist, charismatic, whatever else church right now. You'd have to decide what's right for you.
I'm sorry. I said that wrong. You'd have to ask the Lord what's right for you. That's what's wrong with America. Everybody wants to decide what's right for himself. We gave up that right when we became a Christian. Hmm. The idea here in this passage, however, when it mentions fornication, idolatry, adultery, effeminate, effeminate and abusers of themselves with mankind, you do know what that's referring to. Not that we're teaching on that tonight, but both of those two things in the original language refer to homosexuality. No more about that. Let's move on. <clears throat> but uh, it's talking about habitual, ongoing. If you just have a sin and you fall and you commit one of these sins, that doesn't mean you're going to hell tomorrow. But if you live the life of a drunkard, you're headed that way. Unless you get help. Amen? That's what it's saying in the scripture here. The Amplified says it this way, I will not become the slave of anything. That's the idea that you're after. Do you have to take a drink? Then I'd check my heart and I'd go to God and find out why. Because you're meeting some kind of a need there with that drink that God only is supposed to meet. He's the peacemaker. He's the one that calms the storm. He's the one that gives courage. He's the one that instills faith in us. Not a drink, not a drug, not even a person, but him and him alone. Amen? Uh, when we look at the life of the story of Samson, everybody knows Samson, the strong guy. Samson and Delilah. It's probably the best picture in the scripture of an addict. Samson. Probably the best picture. Um, said here, either our faith will destroy our addictive behavior or our addiction will destroy our faith. And you see that in Samson's life. I think everybody knows Samson. Uh, you find his story in Judges 13. <coughs> Verse 24, he's born. And it carries on for about three chapters. Samson is an up and down guy because he's addicted. He's addicted... He's addicted to love, the carnal kind. And uh, because of his addiction, he'll sell out, he'll do anything to get what he needs for his fix. And you know the story. He's got supernatural strength from God. And uh, a lot of people are addicted to power. You ever know anybody addicted to power? They'll do anything to get power. Manipulate, cheat. And so some of the women in his lives were being used by some other men who were addicted to power to play on Samson's addiction, which is oftentimes what addicted people do. They just all rip each other off all the time to get their fix. And unfortunately, the people they love, the people that are innocent, many times become codependent in this situation and let them use them. And it destroys them too. But in Samson's situation here, anyway, uh, they, played, they played this game with him and they kept trying to find out where his strength was. And, and, uh, and he'd always, at first, he'd give up a secret that wasn't true. I mean, the guy was too stupid to figure out. Every time I tell them something, they do it. You know, but that's part of the game of an addicted person. They can't help it. They still go back. It's like the dog that returns to his vomit. You know, um, that's gross, but nevertheless, it is what it is. And that's what Samson would do. And you know the story, basically. Um, it's pretty well summed up in that statement. Either our faith will destroy uh, our addictive behavior or our addiction will destroy our faith. Samson had a little bit of both in the end. 
in the end, you know, the story, Delilah, she gets the secret, they shave his head, he loses his strength, he prays one last time, and he says, God, if you'll just give me strength to destroy these Philistines, my enemies, God, he says, <clears throat> then he says, uh, you know, I'll be recompensed. And God does, and he pulls down the pillars, and the palace falls in, 3,000 are killed, including him. And that's how he dies. And it's a sad story. But pretty much it's the life of every addicted person in way, one way or another. He was judge of Israel. Samson wasn't just any fly-by-night guy with big muscles like you see on TV. <laughs> he was a judge of Israel. He was the man for 20 years. This went on for 20 years, which addiction does until it kills you. Unless you get help. Unless someone helps you or helps these people. <clears throat> the addict attempts to get his needs met by killing his emotional pain through some form of activity or drug. Because they seldom quit their addictive behavior, even when it's severely damaging their lives, they actually abuse themselves. Today, addictions are characterized either as substance addictions, like drugs and alcohol, or process addictions, like sex, eating, gambling, or workaholism. Again, don't you see America in these examples? In Joshua chapter 9... The Hivites of Gibeon, if you're wondering where we're at, we're on page 5. I see somebody kind of looking around. Uh, we're on page 5, the second or third paragraph there. In Joshua chapter 9, the Hivites of Gibeon were subtle in their dealings with the Israelites. They convinced the Israelites that they were to be trusted as friends. In the same way, the Hivite giants today present themselves as our friends. Later we see and we learn that the dangers involved inviting these same type of Hivites, spiritually speaking, into our lives. Um, <clears throat> some people, some counselors believe that sexual addiction is the most difficult addiction to treat. And uh, the reason basically is, is because it involves hormones. It uh, triggers endorphins and adrenaline in the body. It's very similar to some of the drugs that people take. And so it's, it's, it's very difficult to treat it. it in other words, it, people get a chemical high kind of like they get off of some drugs and, and things of that nature. So it's hard to treat. The most comprehensive information concerning addictions in the Bible, we already said this, is Samson's life. There's a number of addictions that are mentioned in the Bible. And a few of those examples are Nabal. Uh, he possibly died of an alcoholic seizure. King Saul was addicted to rage and domestic violence. He was a wild man, if you remember reading about his life. <laughs> you know, the guy was just a nut. <laughs> um, <clears throat> Solomon. Solomon was addicted to work, sex, and possibly alcohol. Yet, in the beginning, Solomon was a great man. He had wisdom. He had a heart after God. And then he turns out that, you know, he's just overcome with addictions. Eglon and Eli were most likely addicted to food. Two very large, overweight individuals. Lot struggled with homosexuality. In addition, the Bible deals with drug addictions under the more inclusive name of sorcery. Um, I didn't put it, or it's not in the notes here, but the Greek word for sorcery is pharmakia. Can y'all say that? You recognize anything in that Greek word? It's where we get our word, pharmacy, pharmaceutical, what have you. It's pharmakia. And uh, <clears throat> this is the Greek word for sorcery. And what it actually means is witchcraft. It's what it is. It's casting, it means to cast a spell. Um, and that's what happens with drug addiction. That's what happens with uh, many of these addictions. It's, it's putting someone under a spell. Uh, pornography is at like 85% now for young men. 
in America. Uh, it's just astounding. And it's an addiction. It is a qualified addiction in uh, psychological circles. And it's because it affects them chemically in the brain. It's out of control. It's like putting a spell on someone. Uh, let's talk a little bit here about the gangrene model of addictions. The basic concept here, to put it in a nutshell, is similar to someone who gets an arm damaged, uh, for example, in battle or in a car wreck or anything, and uh, nobody wants to lose a limb. And so you know it's damaged, and you know that it's, 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 it's not going to get well, and it's becoming putrid. And the doctor says, we've got to take that arm off. And you're like, no, it's going to be fine. Here, put a bandage on it. Let me cover it up. Let me hide it. Uh, and, and we want to cover it up, and we're ashamed of it. You know? But if I hide it and cover it up, then I don't see it. Nobody sees it. And it's going to be okay. It's not going to be okay. It's going to kill you if you don't deal with it. And that's kind of the concept we're talking about here. They'd rather deal, <clears throat> rather than deal with the emotional pain, they attempt to deny its existence and to kill the pain with some type of drug. And that's, what, that's all addictions is about. It starts some, for some people in childhood. It may happen later in life. But somewhere along in their lives, they got wounded. They got hurt. Some experience, some event took place. They're lacking something. They have a void. There's a need deep down inside of them. There's a cry that's not being met spiritually as God wants to minister and wants to meet it. And when that need's not being met, they reach for something else. And then that something else begins to infect them and their body. And it, it takes a hold of them. And it ha that has to be removed. And then the real issue has to be dealt with, has to be healed and restored. And that's why Christian ministry, Christian Recovery is so important because just treating it medically basically says we're just going to treat you and make you feel better. Most medical treatment in this area deals with symptoms. We'll get you straightened out. We'll treat you medically. We'll help you uh, in the area of alleviating some of your symptoms and get you back up and going again. But it doesn't last very long because they don't 